Well, I want you to take your Bibles this morning and turn to Matthew chapter number 2, if you will. Matthew chapter 2, you say, Pastor, we are not, it's not Christmas anymore. We are in a brand new year, and you're exactly right about that. Uh, But these are some thoughts that the Lord had given me around the Christmas holiday, and they're just way too good to pass up. And so I'm going to talk to you about this subject today, what we learn from Herod the king. Now, uh, for two or three services, we talked about what we learned from the wise men, and uh, Lord really, uh, really blessed in that. And but God gave me a message concerning this: what we learned from Herod the king. And I want to talk to you a little bit about that today, if if I could. Now, last Sunday morning, wow, what an encouraging time we had together. Uh, and uh, and today's going to be a little bit more of a soul searching type message. Uh, this would be more of what I call a challenge. And so Matthew chapter 2 in your Bibles, and when you find your place, if you're able to stand, why don't we stand this morning out of respect for the reading of the Word of God. Matthew chapter 2, and we're going to start in verse number 1 and read down through verse number 12. Now we're going to read, we're going to use more verses than just these first 12 verses, but uh, just for the sake of scriptural reading, we'll just read through verse number 12 today. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born, king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, Art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privately called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when ye have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were coming to the house, not the stable, by the way, don't forget we learned that when they were coming to the house, this was much later, they saw the young child, not the babe, but they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, They presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. You may be seated this morning. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about this subject, what we learn from Herod the king uh, or from King Herod. There's, There's a reason that God has put this scripture in our Bible today. And I want to try to give you a few thoughts, if I could, some things that the Lord laid on my heart. I definitely think they're worth, uh, worth noticing. And so why don't we uh, pray together as a church? Let's ask the Lord to help us, and then we'll jump right into the Bible study this morning. Father, we love you and thank you for your mercies that seem to be running after us. God, thank you for your goodness to us and And uh, Lord, we needed that reminder today, and we thank you for that reminder. God, we needed that reminder that you're coming, that Lord, it could take place in a moment, that today could be the day. God, that's why we come to the house of God, to be reminded of these things. Yes, we already know them, but we need to be reminded of them. And we need to be reminded of them sometimes on a weekly basis. And so, Father, thank you for the reminders this morning And Lord, most of what I'm going to teach today, our people already know these things. But Heavenly Father, we need this reminder. And so I pray that you'll knit our hearts together as you've done so faithfully over the years. And God, I pray that we'll be taught and I pray that we'll be reminded of things that will help us in our everyday Christian walk. Save that soul that's nearest hell. Lord, that one that's here today under the sound of my voice, if they're lost without Christ, I pray today, January the 9th, 2022, would be the day of their salvation. If they're watching by way of live stream and they don't know Christ as Savior, I pray today would be the day. Father, encourage that child of God that's a little discouraged. God, encourage them greatly. 
But Father, more than these things, we pray for the main thing. And the main thing is that Jesus would be glorified and that he would be lifted up and that he would receive praise, glory, and honor. He is deserving and worthy of that. Fill us with the Spirit of God now, Lord, as we preach and as we learn. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray and for his sake and all God's people said, amen. And boy, how many, number one, how many are thankful for your Bible today? Amen. What a blessing. The Bible is an honest book. It not only heralds the work of those who are godly and admirable, but the Word of God clearly shows the works of those who are godless and deplorable. It shows both. Not only do we learn in the Christmas story about the incredible And it really was the incredible dedication of Joseph and Mary and also of the wise men. Not only do we learn of God's amazing display of provision through the wise men, but in Matthew chapter 2, we see a Bible character who would be considered somewhat of a villain. And he really is. And whether we like him or not, and we really don't like him, and he's not portrayed to be a good character in the story But whether we like him or not, God definitely allows King Herod to play a major role in the story of Christmas. And so there are a lot of great characters. We see Jesus, of course. He's the main character. He plays the leading role. We see Joseph and Mary. And the more I study that out, the more I'm just absolutely amazed at the dedication of Joseph and Mary. And I so many things I'm tempted to say right now, and I'm not going to do that. I'll save that for a later time. But we see the wise men, we see the shepherds, and how God revealed his, uh, his news to, of all people, lowly, poor, smelly shepherds in a field. Not only do we see these wonderful characters, but the Bible portrays a villain here by the name of King Herod, We notice here that Herod's name is mentioned nine times in 23 short verses. And that's just the the, the times that his name is mentioned. He's actually alluded to quite a few more times than just those nine times in this short, short chapter in Matthew chapter chapter 2. Now, this, this part was not originally in the message, but I definitely think it's worth us talking about. Someone says, preacher, why would the Bible allude to Herod? He's not a good guy. He's not an honest fella. He, uh, th- there was no love lost between him and Christ. And so why would the Bible, that's limited in its space, why would the Bible uh, talk about King Herod? Well, let me tell you one of the great things about the Bible is the Bible is so faithful to always show us a contrast. And Originally, like I said, I didn't have this in the, in the message, but this is definitely worth our noticing. And, and as, I, as I was just meditating on the message and thinking about the message, it seemed like one of the things the Holy Spirit showed me was what I'm about to give you is that the Bible shows us an amazing contrast between King Herod and King Jesus. Now, what do you mean, Pastor? Well, think about it. As we read Matthew chapter 2, we see that King Herod was the prince of trouble. Verse 3 says, when Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled. Now, we'll get into that a little bit more in depth here in just a moment. But King Herod truly was the prince of trouble. And yet we find that King Jesus is the prince of peace. Isaiah the prophet said it like this. He shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Not only that, but I noticed this. I noticed that King Herod called wise men privately. Did y'all see that in verse number seven? You say contrast. The contrast is that King Jesus always calls wise men publicly. Always does. We notice here in in Matthew chapter two that King Herod wanted worship. And yet we find that King Jesus was worthy of worship. He didn't have to desire it. It just came to him. We notice that wise men were warned to turn from King Herod, Matthew chapter 2, verse number 12, and yet we find that God commands all men to turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. We notice that in Matthew chapter 2, verse 13, that Herod came to destroy, but we're thankful that King Jesus came to save. 
And so there's an amazing contrast here that's going on. And I would just, if I could, can I just stop a moment and can I just ask this question? Is there any chance that your life is in contrast to the life of Jesus Christ? Brother Horn taught on that very eloquently this morning that we are predestined to be conformed to his image. When you get saved, that God, uh, God wants you to be conformed to the image of his son. In other words, our life is to be a, a reflection of what Jesus Christ is all about. And so I would, I would just ask this today, that is your life in any way, is it a, is it a contrast? Does your life not match up to Jesus? The way you talk, the way you act, the way you live the way you treat others. And so we see that amazing contrast. But we notice here that, as I mentioned a moment ago, that King Herod was very troubled. Look at verse 3. The Bible says, when Herod the king had heard these things, talking about the Christ child, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And so let me answer this question first of all, and then we'll jump full-blown into the message today. Why was Herod so troubled about this rumor of a boy king. Somebody says, Pastor, was it because he was power hungry? That's part of it, I believe. Was it because he was just insane? That's another part of it. I believe that as well. But I believe one of the reasons that Herod was so troubled at this, uh, at this word of a boy king, he was so troubled because if you go back and study this out, Herod was not in the rightful line of, uh, he, was, he was not the rightful king of Israel. Now, we talked about that a few Sundays ago. We talked about uh, you needed to be in that, that bloodline of David uh, to, uh, to have rightful, uh, to, to have rights to the throne. And as, as we study this out, we notice here that Herod was not in that line. Uh, Herod was not in the bloodline of King David. Uh, actually, Herod was appointed by Rome. And if you study this out, you'll find out that some say that Herod purchased his way onto the throne and others say that he politicked his way onto the throne. And Herod really was. He was what we would call the... Uh, Man, he was the politician of all politicians, and, uh, and, and that, that's what he was. And so because of that, the Jewish people really resented King Herod. They resented his reign. That's why, by the way, if you go back and do a little historical study, you'll find out that, that occasionally, although Herod really didn't love the Jewish people at all, uh, Herod was continuously trying to do little things that would appease them, things that would make them happy. And that's because they saw King Herod as a pawn of Rome. They, they thought that, you know what, he was, he, he, was, he was not one of their people. He was just a politician. And because of that, boy, they... There was not a lot of love lost between the Jewish people and King Herod. But as we study this story out, there are definitely some things we can learn from this fellow named Herod. You say, preacher, what are they? Well, how about just a few real quickly today. Number one, we learn from King Herod that he was a miserable king. Look, if you will, back at verse number three again. Interesting verse here. Verse three, the Bible says, when Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled. Notice that word, I've got to underline. He was troubled, and notice the last part, and all Jerusalem with him. He was troubled. It's the Greek word terasso, and it means this. It means to stir up or to agitate. It means to, to take away his calmness of mind. And by the way, that was something that you did not want to do when it came to King Herod. You didn't want to take away his calmness of mind. The people that served around Herod wanted to keep him calm because they knew he was a loose cannon. They knew that he was totally unpredictable. And so we find here that when Herod was troubled, all around him were troubled a well. When he was unhappy, everybody knew it. Man, I thought about this. Can I ask you a question? When you're displeased, does everybody know about it? Does everybody know that you're displeased? Now, don't take this wrong. And this, again, I said this is going to be a little bit more of a soul-searching sermon this morning. But can I ask you a question? Are you predictably grouchy? Are you predictably irritable? All right, can I ask it like this? I think this is a good question for us to ask ourselves. When you walk into a room, does the mood of the room brighten or does the mood of the room darken? 
Are people glad to see you come or are they elated to see you go? You know what? Don't, don't you hate that, folks? Don't you hate, don't, don't you hate being around people that make you always walk on eggshells? You know what I'm talking about. I mean, you just came out of the Christmas season, New Year's, and you're around people you're not normally around, maybe family members or, you know, different, different people that you don't always see. And it's those kind of folks that when you're around them, you always have to be very careful about the way you act. You have to be very careful about what you say because just the slightest little thing sets them off. The slightest little thing gets under their skin. The slightest little thing makes them grouchy or makes them irritable or makes them go off on people. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I noticed about this story is I'm reading reading through Matthew chapter 2, is I noticed something very sad. I noticed that the wise men avoided Herod. Did y'all see that? Look back at your Bibles again, Matthew chapter 2 and verse number 12. The Bible says, and being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, notice this, they departed into their own country another way. Because of his mannerisms, because of his attitude, because of the way he conducted himself, the wise men actually avoided going back to King Herod. What a terrible thought to think that people actually avoid us because of our spirit and our attitude. Now, I'm going to tell you something, church. Listen, I don't know about anybody else, but that does something for me. I would hate to think that people avoid me because they know I'm going to be grouchy. I'm going to be irritable. Uh, They know that, uh, oh, here he comes, you know, and I know when he comes, it's always going to be negative and he's always always going to be critical and he's always going to find something, some something, a little nitpicky thing to say. And, you know, we can't concentrate on all the the, the, the positives that are going on. We're always concentrating on the negative and we're always got to, you know, put this little snip in here and this little snap in there. And and we're always, you know, and, and because of that, people get to the place where they begin to avoid us. Listen, God, deliver me from that. Man, when people come into my presence, I want my presence to be an encouragement to them. I I want people to be lifted up because they've been around me. Listen, I'm not a God. I'm just a man like you are. I'm made out of the same stuff you're made out of, but I will tell you this. I'm born again, and I have the Spirit of God residing in me, and I'm just telling you that when people get around me, listen, they at least ought to get a smile. They ought to get a kind word. They ought to get a handshake. I ought to do something in my life that's going to help Help them and lighten their load and encourage them. Uh, listen to me. You say, well, preacher, I know, but COVID's going on. Okay, COVID's going on. And you say, preacher, there's sickness about. Okay, I get all of that, but how many are saved? Well, you know what? If you and I are saved, then there ought to be something different about our life. Did you know the Bible tells us in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse number 10, that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Amen. Man, you say, preacher, but coronavirus, okay. God was here before coronavirus was. And by the way, God will be here when coronavirus is gone. And you know what we better do, church? We better realize we're living in the last days. You say, preacher, I'm hoping it gets a lot better. You and me both, but it may not. We may be in the last of the last. God may be getting his world ready for tribulation. And so if that's the case, how many know this? God's still in control. And since God is still in control and God still has the same power that he's always had and he's able to save like he's always saved and he's able to change your life like he's always changed your life, you know what I might as well do? I might as well be happy. Hey, can I give you a verse? Or several verses, you can just write it down. Psalm 1 1, the Bible says it like this Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Blessed, blessed. The Bible uses that word a lot. Blessed is the man. Now, someone says, Preacher, I know what that means. It means happy. And you're right. You're right about that. When you see that word blessed in your Bible, it's the idea of happy. But I want to tell you something, church. It goes further than that. The word blessed doesn't just mean happy. It means how happy. How happy. That's what the Bible is saying. How happy. 
is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Psalm 32, one, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Can I ask you a question? Is your sin covered today? You say, you better believe it is, preacher. Then guess what? You ought to be happy and not just happy. You ought to be how happy? Man, you ought to be excessively happy. Psalm 32, 2, blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. Psalm 34, 8, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Psalm 40, uh, 40, verse number four, blessed is the man that maketh the Lord his trust. Listen, the church is all I'm saying. If you and I are saved, are born again, our name is written down in heaven, we know that we're a child of God. I'm telling you, when people come, come in contact with us, their life ought to brighten up. Amen. I'm not going to keep, I'm not going to quit preaching that. I'm going to keep on preaching that, Lord willing, till he comes again. There ought to be something different about you. Say, well, preacher, I, I, it's just me. I've always been a grouchy person. Okay, change. Now, I can't change you, but I know someone who can just change and realize, you know what, preacher's right. I am saved. I am born again. I am redeemed. My sin is under the blood. And so why should I be miserable? Man, I ought to have a smile on my face. You say, well, preacher, I know, but I'm so, and don't take this wrong, folks. You say, preacher, I'm so worried. I am so worried if I get covid I might die. Okay. If you die, you just change addresses. That's all you do. And by the way, for that matter, you really start living when you leave here and go to heaven. And so we learn here, though, we learn. We got, we got to go on because I got four more points or three more points. Uh, number one, we see that Herod was a miserable king. Number two, and I'll hit this one very, very quickly. Tonight. Number two, we notice he was a malicious king. Look at Matthew chapter two, verse number seven. The Bible says, then Herod, verse seven, then Herod, when he had privately called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them, the wise men, he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. Now, to be quite honest with you, Herod was not concerned about worshiping Jesus. This was a very deceitful, underhanded way for Herod to try to figure out the exact age of the Christ child. And the reason he wanted to figure that out is because he wanted to kill Jesus. You see, if the wise men saw the star while they were still in the east, and then it took them at least a year to make the trip to Bethlehem, then common sense or logic says that Jesus must be at least a year old He's got to be somewhere a year, two years, which is exactly why Herod did what he did. Now, my point being this, Herod has a heart that desires nothing but hurt for Jesus. He doesn't care about the feelings of Joseph and Mary. He doesn't care about the worship of the wise men. He cares nothing about Scripture being fulfilled and you know, church, I thought about this one. It's a sad, sad place when you care only of yourself. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 15 says it like, See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good both among yourselves and to all men. Peter said it like this in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 8, Finally, be all of one mind, having compassion one of another, Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. Verse 9 says, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrary wise blessing, knowing that you're there and too called, that you should inherit a blessing. And so what do we learn about this king Herod? Number one, he was miserable. Number two, he was malicious, but watch this church. Number three. And this really goes right along with point number two. But number three, we notice he was a mad king. Now look at Matthew 2 again. Look at verse number 16. How many believe your Bible? Amen? Amen. Amen. Verse 16 says, Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding 
wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and all the coast thereof from two years old and under according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Interesting study. When you study this out, uh, an, an abundance of scholars believe that this is fiction. They believe that this atrocity that the Bible says Herod committed never happened. That, uh, uh, number one, because Luke didn't make mention of it, And number two, because Josephus, the historian, didn't make mention of it. And since Luke's gospel didn't mention it and Josephus didn't mention it, well, it must not be true. You say, preacher, where do you stand? (laughs) I stand upon this book right here. That's where I stand. And if if God says it happened, I believe it happened. And by the way, I would ask this to all those self made scholars why is it such a problem for you to believe it happened? Herod was not. He was not man of the year. This guy was incredibly cruel. He was incredibly wicked. You say, how wicked, preacher? Well, ladies, you wouldn't want to marry this guy. Uh, A lady did, and later down the road, he got to the place where he didn't like her anymore, so he just had her killed. He not only killed his wife, but he killed three of his sons. He thought those boys were wanting his throne. And so to make sure that they did not get his throne, he executed three of his boys. At any rate, rate, Herod was totally out of control. Now, this is what I believe we learned from Herod. Nothing mattered except what he wanted. He was willing, Herod was willing to do anything, anything, nothing short. He was willing to do anything to ensure his own happiness. His attitude was this, it's all about me. And Calvary, whether we know it or not, we're living there today. Where there are people that are so selfish that it's all about me. It doesn't matter what God says. It doesn't matter what the word of God says. It is all about me. It's all about my happiness. If I want to, listen, if I, I, if I want to abort a baby, I can do that because it's all about me. If I want to be involved in an immoral relationship, it's all about me. It doesn't matter if I want to take something that doesn't belong to me. It's all about me. If I want to tell a lie and be deceptive, it doesn't matter because it's all about me. Now, there's some things we learn from this idea of selfishness. Number one, selfishness is indicative of the last days. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 says it like this, know also, this know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come for men, first thing, first thing, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. Nothing else matters. It's all about me. And so I don't want to come to church. I don't come to church. You know why? Because it's all about me. And if I don't want to read my Bible, I don't read my Bible because you know why? It's all about me. And selfishness is indicative of the last days, but I'll tell you something else, church. Selfishness is indicative of an unconverted soul. 1 John 3, 16, John is very pointed in his epistle, and John says it like this, Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good and seeth his brother have need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? In other words, if you're just, and I hope there's nobody like that here today, but if you're just selfish, 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 the Bible says that you might want to do some checking up. Because if God's Holy Spirit lives inside of you, one of the things he's going to encourage you to do is to live for others and, and, and to live for Christ. Now, we're done. But I want you to really hear me out on this last point. What do we learn from King Herod? Number one, Herod was a miserable king. Number two, he was a malicious king. Number three, he was a mad king. And how about this church? Number four, we, we learned that he was a mortal king. In fact, 
I never really saw it like I saw it before I started studying this out, but there is a very clear message here in your Bible. Look back, if you will, Matthew chapter 2, look at verse number 15. The Bible says, and was there, and was there, talking about Joseph and Mary, and was there until the what? Until the death of Herod. All right, skip down to verse number 19. Verse 19 says, but when Herod was dead, Skip down to verse number 20. Saying, arise and take the young child and his mother and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead, which sought the young child's life. Now here's my point, we're done. This man, Herod, was living like death would never come. But it did. It did. He was living like he was an immortal I can do what I want to do. I can hurt who I want to hurt. As long as I'm satisfied, as long as I'm happy, as long as I have pleasure. But here's what we better understand, that a day of reckoning is coming. Romans 14, 11 says it like this, for it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. You say, preacher, I don't even believe in God. It doesn't change anything. It's still going to happen. You say, well, preacher, I'm just, you know, I, I'm not concerned with getting right with God right now. It doesn't change anything. There's still a day of reckoning that's coming. Jesus said it like this in Matthew chapter 6, verse number 19. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Can I ask you a question, church? Are you laying up treasures in heaven? You say, preacher, I have a very healthy bank account. Well, praise the Lord. That's wonderful. But are you laying up treasures in heaven? You say, pastor, I have a beautiful car sitting down here in the parking lot. And by the way, praise the Lord. We'll rejoice with you about that. Nothing wrong with that. If you drive a high-dollar car, man, praise God for that. You say, Pastor, I live in a five, six, seven-bedroom home, and we've got two or three bathrooms, and we got bathrooms we don't even need. Praise God. That's wonderful. But I want to ask you a question. Are you laying up treasures in heaven? You say, well, what does it matter? There's a reckoning day coming. We ought to live this life with the next life in mind. Man, I found a story this week. Can I share it with you? Listen to this. A university professor tells of being invited to speak at a military base in December, and they're meeting an unforgettable soldier named Ralph. Ralph had been sent to meet him at the airport, and after they had introduced themselves, they headed toward the baggage claim. As they walked down the concourse, Ralph kept disappearing. Once to help an older woman whose suitcase had fallen open. Once to lift two toddlers up to where they could see Santa Claus. And again, to give directions to someone who was lost. Each time he came back with a big smile on his face. Where'd you learn to do that? The professor asked. Do what? Ralph said. To be so helpful and considerate to others. Oh, Ralph said, during the war, I guess. Then he told the professor about his tour of duty in Vietnam, about how it was his job to clear minefields, and how he had watched his friends blow up before his eyes one after another. And this is what he said, quote, I learned to live between steps. I never knew whether the next one would be my last so I learned to get everything I could out of the moment between when I picked up my foot and when I put it down again. Every step I took was a whole new world, and I guess I've just been that way ever since. Someone said it like this, a grace-filled life is living between the steps. It understands the remarkable gift of today. Now, church, I just said all that to say this. We don't know if we've got tomorrow. I hope you do. I'm planning on being back tonight excited for the revival, but there's no guarantee of that. 
I don't know that I'll make it back tonight. And by the way, you don't know that you'll make it back tonight. And we don't know that we'll draw a breath until we get out to the car. Life's very fragile. If we've learned anything in 2020 at Calvary Baptist Church, we've learned that point. Life's very fragile. And what we had better do as God's people is we had better live every single day like we're about to meet God. Because we're going to. One way or another. Sooner or later. For some of you folks, it'll be later. For some, it'll be sooner. You say, Pastor, I'm just a young person. I get it. But young people die every single day. And so there's a reason that God put this fella. I started to say gentleman. He was not a gentleman. There's a reason God put this man in the Bible because I believe God warned us to learn about some things that we should not do. And so would you do me a favor today? Would you bow your heads with me today? And can I ask you a question? Are you living between the steps? Are you living every day like today may be the day that you'll meet God? And if you're not, man, I want to encourage you today. Let's do business with the King of Kings. Thank God for the King of Kings. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. And I would just ask this today. How many are here this morning would say, Pastor, If I died today, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I am saved and on my way to heaven. If that's you this morning, without anybody looking around, you'd say, Pastor, I know that I'm born again. I know that I'm born again. If that's you, would you just slip your hand up right now as a testimony? Preacher, I know that I'm saved. Praise the Lord. You can lower your hands. Let me ask you this, though. Is there one here today, anywhere, who would say, Pastor, in all honesty, I could not raise my hand. And if I died today, I'm not 100% sure that I would go to heaven. And I care enough. I want you to pray for me. I'd slip up my hand right now and say, Preacher, would you pray for me? You'd slip your hand up right now. Let me pray for you. Is there one? Anywhere? Anywhere? I see a couple hands. Is there another? Preacher, if I died today, I'm not sure that I would go to heaven. Would you pray for me? Is there another? Anywhere? Can I pray for you? Can I pray for you? Hey, child of God, can we just, all of us, can we just do some soul searching? I'm going to tell you something. Before I ever brought this message to you today, God's been using it in my own life this week. Man, I don't want to be guilty of these things that Herod was guilty of. I don't want to darken the room when I walk in. Man, I want to brighten it. I want people to see the love of Christ through me. Man, I want people to see, I want people to be glad when I walk in and not sad when I walk in. If God's dealing with your heart right now, in just a moment, we're going to have what we call an invitation. And this up front is what we call an altar. And if you're here today and the Spirit of God is dealing with your heart, and you need to come and just use this altar, we want to encourage you to do that. We'll have some folks up here that have a Bible. And if you need personal help, they'll help you from the Bible. They'll help you. If you need uh, to know how to go to heaven, they'll be here to help you from the Bible. If you've got a heavy burden and you need someone to pray with you, they'll be here to help you pray. But, But they don't have to pray with you. You can just come and find a place, and just you and Jesus can get along. Would you do us a favor today? Would you stand all over the house? Father, thank you for this time we've had together today. Lord, I pray that you'll help us to search our heart. God, help us to make sure that our life is is in accordance to your will. Oh, God, I pray that we will live in such a way that, that the joy of the Lord shines through us. Father, that when we're around people, Lord, that they'll see Christ. Lord, would you help us that, that people would, would, would not only, Lord, that, that they'd want to be around us because we have the Spirit of Christ that's just emanating from our life.
Father, save that soul that's, that's lost today and encourage that child of God that's discouraged. God, help us to, to live a life that exemplifies what Jesus is all about. Thank you for this time we've had together today. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Our personal workers are on their way. If you're here this morning and say, Pastor, I need to be saved. If that's you, would you just slip out? And we have someone down here who would love to meet you with a Bible, and we'd love to pray with you today. If God's dealt with your heart about any need at all, any need at all, hey, listen, why don't you use the altar today? Pastor, I have been saved, but I've never followed the Lord in believer's baptism. If you need to make yourself a candidate for believer's baptism, we're going to invite you to come today. Preacher, we are... Uh, we're not the member of a Bible-believing church, and we feel it God's will that we join with Calvary. We're going to invite you to come today while we wait. Maybe you're here this morning and say, Pastor, I am saved. I am saved, but as I begin this new year, 2022, I need to rededicate my life to Christ. Pastor, I didn't even mean to let it happen, but I sort of got away from the things of the Lord, but I still love Him. And I still love his church, but I need to rededicate my life to Christ and really get back in there and serve the Lord. If that's you, we invite you to come today. All right, while folks are coming, would you make your way to the front? Come on, while we wait, let us pray for you today. Father, I pray that you'd bless. Lord, speak to hearts. Lord, help nobody to leave here today not making the decision they need to make. God, I pray that you'll help us. Lord, help us to be like King Jesus not like King Herod. Have your way in this time of invitation, please, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Would you come while we wait? We're going to pause just for another moment. And if you need to come, listen, altars are open. We'll be glad to help you and pray with you today. Hey, Calvary, can we do this? Can we sing this little chorus once before we go? Let's sing it together. Ready? All to Jesus I surrender, all to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily. Sing it now.
uh, song and a great attitude to have as we begin this brand new year in 2022. Well, I'm encouraged by the crowd today. I appreciate you being here. And uh, we've got really, in spite of all that's going on, there's a great crowd here today. And we thank the Lord for that. Hey, listen, I hope you have a great afternoon. And we'll look forward to seeing you tonight as we kick off our New Year's Revival. Six o'clock tonight. Doors will be, be open much sooner than that. And so come a little early for fellowship. And then we'll start the service at 6 p.m. tonight. All right. Brother Mike, would you come? And I'm going to have you dismiss us in a word of prayer. If you have a need, don't hesitate to come and see us today. We'd love to pray with you. By the way, I completely, I completely neglected the live stream today. If you're watching live stream and you have a need, listen, there's a number on the bottom of your screen right now, 704-321. See, I'm gone. I lost it. I lost it. Anyway, hey, there's a number on the bottom of your screen. And uh, you, you call, help me out. There you go. Thank you. 327-5662. And uh, have you ever started shaving on the wrong side? And then you completely got, oh, how do I, you know? Hey, we're glad to have you watching. <laughs> and if you're watching and you have a need, call us. We have some folks right by the phone right now. would love to take your call. And thank you for watching today. God bless you. Amen, Brother Mike. Pray for us if you will. Father, we bow our hearts and heads before you today. And some folks raised their hand that they weren't sure. Lord, that if, they, if, if today is the day, and we know death's coming, you tell us in your word, it's appointed unto man once to die, but after that, the judgment. And Father, some raise their hand that they're not sure. That means if, if they were to walk out of here today and have a heart attack, have an accident, lose their life, that probably they would spend eternity separated from you, not because they have to, but because they choose to. Lord, I pray that before they leave, they'd take the pastor's hand, take my hand, take someone's hand, and say, please show me that I might know for sure. Show me where the word of God says that I can know for sure. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for sending someone our way to tell us about the precious Savior that you provided for us when you gave your only begotten son, Jesus. We thank you that though you didn't have to, though you could have called 10,000 angels, you looked out at the people that were standing there at the foot of your cross, and you said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Father, don't let anyone leave here not knowing, not knowing where they're going to spend eternity. Help them, Father, to know, according to your word, how much you love them, and Father, what you've done on their behalf. Forgive us, Father, where we've failed you. Thank you for what we've learned today. Father, help us use it to bring honor and glory to your name. These things we ask you for and thank you for in Jesus' precious name, amen. Thank you for joining us today. We consider it an honor to serve you. And our prayer is that the service was a blessing and an encouragement to your life. If you were impacted today by the preaching of God's word, we encourage you to respond. If we can pray with you, or if you would like to make a decision today for Christ, please call us here at 704-327-5662. We have people waiting right now on the lines prepared to help you. Again, thank you for joining us today, and we hope to welcome you again soon. Have a wonderful week.